what would be like a standard due diligence that maybe I should be asking for? Like if it, if I have to go through planning, is that like a 90 day, 180 days, uh, a full year of due diligence? If it's raw land and you want entitlements in place, meaning you want it to be 100% guaranteed that you're able to do it, it is going to be a very long time. That could take you six months to a year. How should somebody go as it relates to the research process to find an area or a location where uh, this is more likely to succeed. I really talk about picking their avatar. That's gonna help you make decisions on your property because it's not just where they're staying. What is their experience gonna be like while they're there? The specific location wouldn't be as important as it is your marketing ability for that. That location isn't as important if you're selling your experience. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Residual Real Estate Agent Show. Uh, today, we've got a very special guest. Her name is Heather Blankenship. She's based out of South Florida, owns about $30 million worth of real estate. Yes, you heard it right. $30 million. Uh, today, Heather is going to be explaining to us what is glamping, how does it work, uh, can you Airbnb? Uh, is it only tents? Is it RV parks? And then uh, just different setup ideas. Welcome to the show, Heather. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you today. Yeah, same here. So I'm excited because I just recently got into Airbnb. Most of my rentals have been just long term rentals, and the cash flow on it has doubled or tripled in some cases. But then I hear these stories about glamping and these unique Airbnb experiences, and I don't really know much about it. So I'm excited to have you on. Before we get started, just who is Heather and how did you get involved in this wonderful world of uh, real estate investing? Well, I've been investing in real estate for over a decade now. Um, I was driving across the country in a camper from Florida to California and i kept staying at these rv parks and i was looking around i was a finance manager at the time nothing related to real estate at all and and i'm looking around and seeing all these rv parks and how full they were and all the different streams of income that they've got and how much money they're making i'm like dude this is just renting parking spots it's got to be easy it is not renting parking spots <laughs> I'd be like buying a parking garage which i now know um, but by the time I got to California, I had bought an RV park that I had never seen before and came back to Tennessee and had to figure out exactly how you run an RV park. Uh, fast forward a few years and um, I own RV parks, mobile home parks, Section 8 multifamily, some uh, short term rentals. I just bought my first motel. So I'm kind of in a few different asset classes. It's kind of crazy because you jumped in and then you figured it out how to do it. But I imagine that that was a really good property for you. And then obviously it helped you like transition into other things, which kind of just shows that sometimes you just got to jump in and then figure things out, make the, make the commitment. Um, so for our viewers out there, like what is glamping? How does it work? Where can you do it? Sure. So glamping is glamorous camping. So a lot of people want to say they went camping. They want to post it on Instagram. They want to go with their kids, but they don't actually want to sleep in a tent and they don't actually want to carry all of the crap that you need to set up and, you know, spend a couple hours setting up your campsite and tearing it down and, and the, the ins and outs of that. So they, they want this luxury experience that's still kind of camping. Um, the unique experience aspect of it seems to have grown dramatically during COVID and has continued after. And so you will even notice on, you, you said you just got your first couple of Airbnb. So as you notice the Airbnb website even changed dramatically um, a couple months ago to kind of highlight some of these unique experiences and different options that people are looking for. And so it's a whole new world. Um, it's about a $3 billion industry and is expected to grow to 6 billion over the next few years. So it's increasing quickly. You know, it's funny when you said you don't have to set up a tent, you don't have to do this. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went and stayed in one of the properties. At, there, there's a couple more institutional glamping 
uh, companies. They've got different properties all over the country near some of the national parks. And the one specifically that I stayed in, their version of heat was a wood fired stove. And so you had to wake up every, it was cold and you had to wake up every couple hours and put a log on the fire. I'm like, this is camping. I am a glamper. I want it to be warm in here <laughs> to start with. So oftentimes the glamping accommodations even have heat and air. And, you know, it's very much like staying in a typical property. So is it like a tent? Is it a tiny home? Like, are there different types of like glamping? So there's all different types. You know, you've got your, when you say tent, if you imagine like a safari tent that you've seen um, on the internet or in a movie or something like that, they're, those are kind of the standard baseline of something that you might find, but they have grown so much over the last few years. Some of these safari tents are costing you around $50,000 because they have bathrooms, they have kitchens, they have different bedrooms in them, and they're truly this luxury experience. And in some places they rent for five or $600 a night. And then you've got, um, you do, there is a base version of that that's not quite as extreme but you'll also see teepees they've got domes now that are really cool uh, you're you're right the, the tiny homes fall into that kind of unique experience category as well as i've seen remodeled train cars and kind of old buses that they've remodeled um there's tree houses there's yurts there's there's sky's the limit in these glamping experiences that people are setting up and are most of these glamping experiences like in rural more base areas like areas where you would normally camp and is that what makes them like glamping or are they like uh in i would imagine that they're not like in your traditional mom and pop type of neighborhood or can they be they can be. I've seen them in all different places. And some of that's going to be affected by um, the, the zoning. So when you're looking at areas that seem like they'd be a great spot for um, glamping, it does sometimes when we're people who invest in single family homes, you get used to this mentality of, oh, I'll do whatever it is that I'm thinking of doing and, and I'll ask for forgiveness later with the city planning or zoning or if something happens. But as you move to some of these more commercial aspects of real estate, you can it can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars even millions of dollars if you mess up or make the wrong decision on some of that stuff so you really want to find out ahead of time you're calling your planning and zoning department and finding out what is and isn't allowed oftentimes they don't already have rules in place for it so you're gonna to have to talk them through it and teach them about the asset class and figure out exactly what they'll allow in your area and so some areas allow it some don't some neighborhoods allow it some don't some rural areas allow it some don't but if we're not talking about a neighborhood and you're looking at this beautiful piece of property and you're thinking oh my god this would be perfect for glamping there's two things you need to figure out right from the get-go and that's what we just talked about planning and zoning to making sure that they're allowed and the second is going to be your utilities because even though we think of camping as kind of off the grid people are still going to need somewhere to shower which you could technically figure out but it wouldn't be as great um they're still going to need a little bit of power and they're going to need some kind of sewage like you got to get rid of the sewage somehow so you're going to need to figure out your utilities and your planning and zoning those utilities will make or break your deal it doesn't have to be traditional uh, city water, city sewer, but you're going to need some options for that. And then if I was going to the city and I was wondering to see if like uh, a specific property uh, applied, is there a specific type of zoning? I know that the zoning varies area by area, but I is there like some sort of specific type of zoning? And if there isn't a specific type of zoning, you said that maybe I have to walk the city through the process of kind of understanding like, okay, like this is what we're looking to do. How would I walk the city through that process or what would that conversation look like with the city? It's interesting you asked that. I had to do it not long ago on one of my properties. I have 15 glamping tents in an area that they weren't in that area before. And so when I was going through that process with city planning and zoning, not only did they want to know exactly what my plan was, and I had to submit drawings of these uh, structures, which I was able to get from the manufacturer. That wasn't tough. They wanted very specific details on the how they were fire retardant and what kind of chemicals were used to make sure that they weren't going to catch on fire with people inside of them. And um, they had to be a very specific width um, apart from each other that was different from, say, a, a traditional campsite. So um, they're going to, depending on what city you're in, they're going to ask some pretty specific details. But 
don't let that scare you. It's a really awesome industry. It's got it's like a perfect mix between cash flow and appreciation if you do it the right way as far as having it properly zoned, having multiple in one area because then you have a commercial property that's a business that is valued off of the income that you're taking in. So, you were telling me earlier about how great the cash flow was on your Airbnbs. It's kind of similar to that, only in Airbnbs if you have a house, when you go to sell them, they're still valued off the the price of that house, which is valued off a of square foot on things around you and stuff like that. These properties are valued off of the money that you're taking in. So it's a really great cash flow as well as appreciation play if you do it the right way. So let's say that I find a location, the city says, yes, um, we would allow glamping. Is there a chance that they say yes? And then once you close escrow, like they're like, oh, there's this clause or a caveat or this or that. Because I know like in California, like um, it's almost like the city will tell you one thing and you make your decision based on that. And then you go back to them and like, oh, section 493 of the section code uh, says this or that. And now everything that they've said, you relied on that information to obviously make a decision. Um, is there, are there certain things that you can do to almost like protect yourself from that? Because I, I would imagine the the worst thing you'd want to do is buy a site where you think, hey, I'm going to do 20 glamping sites. It's new to the city. And then they come up with this, this like objection as to why you can't do it. You're exactly right. And so that doesn't just apply to glamping. I do this with my RV parks I'm purchasing, the mobile home parks that I own, because they're a little different than multifamily or single family homes. I'll call the city again, using an example of an RV park or a mobile home park, and I'll say, how many sites or lots is this proper property zoned for or are allowed at this location? And I get a letter from the city stating like to me in my name, not the current owner's name, saying that that's how many it's allowed for. That's how many it's zoned for. This is how many, you know, are allowed here. And it's dated and whoever is in charge in that office has signed that saying that's what's allowed there. And so that keeps them from just answering, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's allowed here. You know, they've actually looked into it and made sure. So I'm not purchasing that property without acknowledgement from the city. Now they're not gonna easily tell you how many you can have there or exactly what you can do, but they'll be able to tell you if it's an option for you. If it's kind of open-ended like you're talking about, I would want to go through the city planning zoning meetings and get it approved before I close on that property. You might have a longer due diligence period, which isn't uncommon for land to have longer due diligence because some city plannings, you got to go through three city planning meetings or whatever the number is for that area. And um, I'm in the middle of a motel project down here in South Florida, and I've got to go through three city planning meetings, which takes up to three months because they meet once a month and I can't start remodeling until that's over. So if that were the case, buying land for a glamping property, I would want due diligence long enough to cover approval from city planning. And then um, what would be like a, an example, like let's say a property that you bought, or I don't even know if you own uh, this type of property, like is there something that you own that maybe wasn't a glamping site before that you bought with, because I imagine that if it wasn't a glamping site, you probably got it at a significant discount because you added a lot of the value to the property because you added the glamping site. Now that property is worth a lot more. Can you give our viewers just an example of that? That way they can see like the power behind this. And I imagine that, uh, cause it's crazy. I'm imagining like, okay, 50,000 for like a, a, a tent or whatever it is. And then you're renting it for three, $500 a month um, or a day. I'm thinking like the, the return on investments huge relative to like an apartment complex or a, um, storage facility or anything like that. Yeah, it is huge. And to compare it to a couple things that you're talking about, first of all, glamping, depending on what area you're in is going to be seasonal. Because your Airbnbs, like you talked about, you may have a seasonality to it, but you don't typically have a period that you're empty for the whole month. Maybe your occupancy is just lower. When you're talking about glamping, it's not uncommon, depending on the area you're in, to be empty for a portion of the season. For example, the ones that I was just talking about with the, that I have 15 in one locations, that property is closed for January and February. It gets too cold for the heat to keep up and for them to 
work effectively. So after New Year's Eve, um, that property shuts down and doesn't open again until mid-March when people start coming in for spring break. And they do have heat, but it's just too cold. And so you could have the same issue with summertime, you know, especially out in uh, West Coast. And I remember being in Joshua Tree. Uh, I think it was last year I went with my kids in a camper. We're coming through and it was like 116 degrees. That would be really tough. I'm thinking those height of the summer months, you wouldn't be able to keep those cool and keep people happy. My point in all of that is there's going to be some seasonality to it. So even though you're bringing in great money, you need to have accounted for you're going to have a couple months that are closed. So it's going to be very, very dramatically throughout different parts of the country based on what you're paying for land, um, based on what your tap fees are and your permits are. But you're exactly right. You should be able to buy a piece of land um, for relatively inexpensive, inexpensively and put in your utilities, put in your tents and some things that you're considering that you aren't with multifamily and stuff like that is your tents are only going to have a specific shelf life. You know, they aren't going to last 50 years, a hundred years. Um, you're going to be budgeting for new tents every 10, 15, 20 years, depending on what type of accommodation that you're buying. So even though you're bringing in significantly better money, depending on uh, what you're putting in, you need to be budgeting to buy new ones. Uh, when I'm budgeting tiny homes, those have a two and a half year return meaning I've made up my money that I put in in two and a half years. So if I'm bringing in 500 bucks a night or if I'm bringing in 200 bucks a night, depending on what it is, anything that I'm making after those two and a half years before I have to replace them is just money in my pocket. So thinking about what your return is, is significantly different than when you're buying a typical Airbnb, but you do got to replace it. Some of them, the, you know, maybe if you're buying a tiny home, you might just be remodeling it like you would a house. But if you're buying a glamping tent, there's portions of the structure that aren't going to last that long because they're made out of canvas. Um, I think they usually tell us about 10 years, so those canvas portions of the structure, which isn't the entire $50,000. It's I think it's five or $6,000 that we're replacing some of those parts. So your capital expense budget's a little different. Um, but you're right. You, you spend it depending on where you're at and exactly what you're doing, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and it's worth a couple million dollars if you if you do it properly. And those are Sometimes they're valued on a cap rate, depending on exactly the way the property's worked, um, but it runs like a business. So some people value them on multiples also, where it's a newer asset class. It's not as kind of set in stone the way people are evaluating them right now. So sometimes it's multiples, like a like a traditional business might be. And depending on what else you have at the property, some people are valuing them on cap rates. And then um, let's say that I did open up escrow on a uh, property. It, and let's say that it's not a, a camping site. Um, what would be like a standard due diligence that maybe I should be asking for? Like if it, if I have to go through planning, is that like a 90 day, 180 days, uh, a full year of due diligence? If it's raw land and you want entitlements in place, meaning you want it to be 100% guaranteed that you're able to do it. It is going to be a very long time. That could take you six months to a year. It, it would be great to tell you that it's only going to be the 90 days of the city planning, but it depends on what you've done beforehand because you're going to need architectural drawings. You're going to need drawings from civil engineers. If you're developing a property ground up from scratch, you know, you're talking months to get those drawings and then you got to go through city planning and get it approved. So that would be a really long period of time which is why for a lot of my students, I suggest that they find smaller mom and pop owned uh, RV parks because it's easy to find RV parks that are 20, 30 sites um, that have some room left for expansion. And then you've already got most of the entitlements in place that you need. And it's going to be significantly easier to get that approved. And you're simply converting those campsites into glamp sites um, so much easier and cost so much less money to convert something like that. Same with tiny. That, but, but utilities a lot of times are already in place for the exactly. RV park. So that makes it a lot easier for the campsites. And they probably already have like proper, somewhat of proper spacing as well too. You just need to have those utilities inspected. So as long as you have them inspected, just like you would any other property, it's so much easier. When you say inspected, like what does that mean? 
Meaning if you, if it's not city water and sewer, if it's a well or a septic system, a normal inspection that you would have done for those, for any other type of property. Same with, there's some scary types of um, utility options though, as you get into RV parks, things like lift stations and wastewater treatment plants and lagoons and things that can go really wrong um, and cost a lot of money, half a million dollars sometimes to fix if, if you get something like that. So I try to steer people away from those kind of alternative uh, sewer waste options. And then, uh, in terms of locations, like what, like, how do I know, like what locations I should be looking for? Um, like, or like, I know you mentioned Joshua tree that seems to be popular. I know Palm Springs has become really popular in California as well, too. Um, as I look through different parts of the country, are you guys looking for like national parks? Are you guys looking for hiking sites? Um, how should somebody go as it relates to the research process to find an area or a location where uh, this is more likely to succeed? So I really talk to my students about picking their avatar. So you need to think about this person who's gonna be staying at your property and what it is they're expecting, what it is they want, how you're gonna cater to them. And that goes from how easy it is to access the property to where's the nearest airport or are they gonna be driving in? What are these people gonna be wearing? What are their interests? So as you think through the avatar of the person that you're catering to, that's going to help you make decisions on your property. And you could be having the model like you're talking about where you're catering to people who are visiting a national park. And that's awesome. And there's quite a few companies that do that already. Or like you said, maybe they're catering to people who are hiking, but picking those kind of touristy areas and tourist town are an awesome option and definitely the most popular. But you can also be doing something that caters to a specific type of person. And what I mean by that is, Maybe you're interested in having yoga retreats. Maybe you're interested in having, you know, wine tasting events, May whatever this specific type of uh, experience that you're wanting to offer, because it's not just where they're staying. What is their experience going to be like while they're there? You could have that anywhere. You know, the, the way social media is and marketing is nowadays, you know, if you grow as you market your yoga retreat, that's this unique glamping experience that people are going to come stay at for three or four days and, you know, do have this. Yeah, I'm not a yoga person, so I'm, I'm making all this up. But my point is, you know, you would be selling them on the idea of that experience. So the specific location wouldn't be as important as it is your marketing ability for that and making sure that you've got the proper utilities in place and then you've got really great information information on wherever the nearest airport is. And then here's how you get there from that airport or, or whatever that is. So that location isn't as important if you're selling your experience. And then, um, can you do like arbitrage on it? Like I know for Airbnb, some people have like a model where they lease from an owner. They don't, they never own the property, but then they do Airbnb. Is there arbitrage in this space? And is there any risk to doing the arbitrage versus owning it? Or is owning it the best way to kind of get started in this uh, niche? I've definitely heard of people doing arbitrage and, and the pros and cons are going to be very similar to Airbnb arbitrage. You know, you don't actually own it. So you're not getting the same kind of tax benefits. You're not getting the appreciation kind of portion of it for when you go to sell it. You're really just getting cash flow. Um, you don't get all of those other benefits that you get when you own real estate or own a business. And so it's still a great option for somebody starting out who's just trying to get that cash flow to get started. But that entitlement process is tough and long. And you'd essentially be giving that entitlement to the owner of the land. It wouldn't be yours. It's the property owners. So you've done a lot of work to get there to not actually own it. But it could be a good option for cash, for cash flow if you don't have that option. And then like, let's say that I did uh, buy my own site. And let's say that I was able to get it entitled um, or I did buy like an RV park. Um, like, how do I find the right manufacturers? How do I find the right people to provide me the right uh, type of tents, toilets, showers, et cetera? Like, are there niche manufacturers for these type of things? And do I just Google like glamping sites or glamping tents for sale or what's the right approach for that? 
Yeah, there, there seems to be a niche for everything. So my favorite manufacturers right now um, for tents and different accommodations, um, I love Tent Masters. They have a really good product. They have really great customer service. Um, and then Conestoga Wagons is out of Texas and they have an awesome product. I really love their product. And they don't just do tents. Their tents are freaking awesome. But they also do uh, bathhouses that are portable so that you can kind of have that made ahead of time and brought in in a rural area as well as covered wagons that are super cool that they've been using for glamping uh, those are two of my favorites but if you were really digging into this and you wanted to go see all of the vendors one of my favorite things about conferences is seeing all the vendors and the products that are offered for your niche um, there is a glamping conference that takes place in October in Colorado so you would go That's somewhere so like awesome. that yeah and see all That's of so the cool. yeah they've got all of them set up and you can see all the different options there Cool. So it's like a way to also meet other operators as well, too, and like kind of like get ideas from them and kind of see what the latest and greatest is. Do the trends or uh, is it like an industry that's consistently changing where you almost have to stay up to date with like almost like a trendy industry where like uh, one year this may be more popular than the next year and you have to kind of change the amenities or the entertainment in any way, shape or form or? Yeah, the only part I would say about that is it's similar to your Airbnb. When you're thinking about the way it's photographed, you want those photographs to be Instagrammable. You want your design elements to be so great that everything stands out. So it's not as much trendy as it is making sure that you've got really great design that photographs really well so that when you're marketing on Airbnb or you're marketing on your own platform or website, which is much better, um, it's attracting people just like a hotel would, you know, you're in hospitality. So your, your goal is to attract those people. So the only trendy part is you'd want to budget just like you would an Airbnb or a hotel to be upgrading and remodeling those types of aspects for your marketing purposes. And then can you give us example, like, uh, like the one that you bought, uh, the one that has 15 clamping sites, what did you buy that for? Was it already entitled at the time that you bought it? Did you have to entitle it? How long was the escrow? What was the purchase price? And if you're open to it about how much it produces in gross, maybe revenue in, in a year and also like operating expenses as well too. Like, I don't know, like I know for multifamily, like once you factor in taxes, insurance, you're probably looking at about a 40 to 50% expense ratio, just depending on the area. Like if you can also kind of go a little bit over expenses as well too, to, kind of keep up with it and then even like like staff as well too i know it's a pretty large question but almost like uh just from an owner's perspective like am i going to need an on-site manager um can i run it by myself just uh almost like walk me through that if you can so it really depends on what the size of the property you're going to have if you're going to have one two three uh glamping accommodations in one location you could definitely run it yourself you but it's going to be similar to running an Airbnb. You're going to need to be managing that schedule. You can either do the cleaning yourself or you can hire out the cleaning and manage your cleaners. Same with maintenance. Any type of property is going to have maintenance. So can you do that maintenance yourself or do you need to be hiring someone out? Very similar to thinking through that idea of owning Airbnbs and which we should be calling short term rentals, but owning short term rentals. And are you doing all those things yourself? Because it's probably not the best use of your time, but sometimes in the beginning, it's what you need to do in hiring that out or hiring a manager. The more you own, the more likely you're going to need a manager and that those people are going to become your own staff. I have my own staff. The property where I have the 15 glamping tents, I also have um, 22 tiny homes and six RV rentals because that's all kind of in that encompassing um glamping um because there's airstreams and stuff like that that people rent as glamping so um there's about 42 total glamping accommodations there so i have my own housekeeping team who's also doing laundry and my own maintenance team there's a manager on site there because if you think about these people staying in these properties they expect if something is wrong that it's fixed right now and um when you own an airbnb and you only have a couple of them you can have that maintenance person that you call, but they're normally not dedicated specifically to you. So sometimes it's a couple of days before you can get someone out to fix something. And most guests don't see that as, you know, an option that it's three days before their air is fixed or whatever the issue is. 
So the, the more you grow, you're going to need a team in place, unless you're just doing one or two small options, uh, then it'd be pretty easy to run yourself. So the property that we're talking about, I owned the land already in that location. So if I had purchased the land, the land would have cost about a half a million bucks, but the land was already in place. I already had that. And um, utilities were already up to the front of the property. So it wasn't as expensive. I was able to just tap in, which were tap fees that I had to pay there. And the part that took forever was the tents. The tiny homes were easy. The rental campers were easy. But the glamping tents took forever going through city planning. They even had me bring in samples of the um, material, the canvas material and all the different layers of it to the city planning meeting for them to look at and talk through. And because I made the mistake that I told y'all not to do early about asking for forgiveness and, and continuing to move forward, I went ahead and put the tents in. And because I was sick of waiting on them, which do not do this. And a couple years later, they come back and they give me a um, a stop order telling me that I can't rent them anymore. So I go back and I go back into the meeting, which I had so many days before I had to do that. And they gave me a, a variance to where I could continue renting them for so long, but I had to get them all this different information. So what ended up happening was I had to pick up the, the most of these sit on like a structure. So they were on essentially like a deck and move them with a crane over like three additional feet because they wanted them to be spread out a certain width and a couple of them weren't quite the right distance. So it was this huge project to have to move these glamping tents over and reset them. I can't believe I found a contractor that could do it. Don't make the mistake of doing it first and, and not waiting on their approval. But um, tiny homes taken about $500,000 a year. And those ones are not uh, the type of tiny homes that are super luxurious they're kind of middle of the row um if i were to, when i replace those eventually i will buy the nicer ones that that um rent for more per night uh, these rent for about 200 dollars a night uh, the area that they're in could definitely take they have the demand for the newer ones that you can rent for more more money those weren't out when i when i was putting this property in place the campers cost me about thirty thousand dollars a piece and those bring in about thirty thousand dollars a year so i'm making about one hundred fifty thousand, or taking in about one hundred fifty thousand a year on those and um then the tents themselves are taking in about three hundred thousand a year and uh the operating expense somewhere between 40 and 50 percent on that property and that that experience part of it is what yeah i know you're thinking well multifamily is about that why is the expense so high when you have the staffing and you're creating that unique experience and you've got all the housekeeping expenses and things like that your expenses quickly get higher you mind me asking when you purchased that property and how much you purchased that property for as well too Oh, uh, well, I bought the land 11 years ago, so I okay. already had that land in place. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the bottom of the market right then and there. Exactly. Awesome. It was, it was after the market had collapsed and I bought the land, bought the land. Then. Was, was that the one that you got from the bank that the bank uh, had foreclosed on it? Or is that a different one? Same bank. Um, and they owned multiple things in that area. So I was able to purchase the land next door for that. That's awesome. Do you mind kind of sharing that experience or that? Because uh, I think that's such a cool story. Uh, I know I've heard it, but I think for our viewers, that would be such a cool story just to kind of uh, know like how you actually got involved in the in in the real estate space. Sure. When we were talking about driving across the country earlier and, and looking at RV parks, um, I didn't know anything about real estate. And I had found this property from Google searching that was in bankruptcy, meaning the bank had already taken it. And they wanted $3.2 million for it. It was it was 21 acres. And it was an RV park at the time that people were living at and had mailboxes outside. It was totally insane. And I call the bank. I was 26 years old. And I'm like, hey, I want to buy this. Like, how much money do you have? I'm like, I don't have any. <laughs> But back then they were doing loans that they wouldn't do now. And so they gave me a non-recourse loan with no money down. And I had six months to figure out how to make my first payment of $18,500, which I'd never had more than a normal mortgage at the time. And I had to figure out how to run an RV park. Now, fast forward a, a decade later, that property is worth getting, getting close to $15 million now. And um, I can use the equity in that property to go out and buy other properties. And then I know that we keep talking about like uh, Airbnb, and I know that you refer to it as short-term rental. I think that's the more appropriate term. I just think for me, I, I it's almost like Kleenex or 
uh like it, it it's it's it, they were first in the industry so it's almost like you use that term a lot but let me ask you this um what are some of the ways that you can market the glamping site like is it only like airbnb vrbo is it like social media marketing or how can somebody uh drive traffic to their unique experience as well too yeah there are tons of sites very similar to airbnb um I think hip camps, one of them, there's, there's a bunch of different sites like Airbnb or VRBO that are specifically for glamping. So you can put them on those sites, just like you would Airbnb or, um, VRBO, but also your goal is really to, especially if you're going to have more than a couple, you want to have direct booking so that you're not paying all those fees and your guests aren't paying those fees. And you're also following those platforms rules. I have a girlfriend who owns quite a few Airbnbs in um, Fort Lauderdale. And lately she's had a couple people tear up stuff or they smoked a ton of weed and it smelled so strong that she couldn't rent it out to the next guest. And Airbnb didn't take her side. They didn't um, pay her out the claims. And you know, you're stuck with that damage. You're stuck with losing the guest. Um, those things are up to them. And they've had some new rules lately like the, the new rules that allow guests to cancel as soon as they come in when they're not happy and, and you, you lose all of that money and you can't rebook it because it happens right at that time. So you're, and the reason I say short-term rental is because you are renting those properties short-term. Airbnb is just a platform that you're using to do that on. So you're, you are controlled by that company, by your business. So it's not always the best business model. So better idea after you own a couple is having your own website that you're direct booking and you're using things like Google AdWords for pay for clicks and your social media to market those things. Now, if you're only going to own one or two, three, probably not worth your time to do all of that. But as you're growing and scaling, you want to have more control over your own business. I would say 20% of my glamping business is through an, another site um, like we've been talking about, but most of them are direct bookings through my own website. I'm marketing my Airbnbs or, uh, or my short-term rentals on Airbnb, but I thought to myself, like, there's a lot of realtors in my area that at times have clients where they may need a temporary place to stay. I've thought about marketing it to those realtors and almost like even providing them like a discount code, like almost like a value add to them and a value add to us because we cut out some of the Airbnb fees. Knowing that, it'll increase the occupancy for some of the uh, buildings that we have. Is there a specific platform or something where I can make it simple where that calendar can sync through my Airbnb calendar just so that uh, I don't double book or anything like that? So there's different platforms that you can do that through. Uh, one that I've used is called Guesty. Um, I've liked it and they do have their own option for building out a site and it does link to the other um, platforms that you're talking about. However, because I have so many, I wanted a different type of software. I use a software called CampSpot. Um, there's quite a few options out there. New Book's still great. Um, there's another one called Astra that's really good. Um, there, there's different types of software. Uh, for the niche industry specifically. And most of those have the option to link with the other sites like you're talking about. I love it. I love it. Cool. And then um, I know that we've talked about all the pros about uh, uh, glamping. What are some of the negatives or what are some of the risks associated with it? Like, have you ever had a negative situation where something didn't go right or a tent caught on fire or something? To, uh, tell us the horror stories. There's always something that doesn't go right in customer service, right? So even though it's real estate, it's still a very active business. It's it's not just collecting people's rent every month like you would in, in a long-term rental option. So dealing with guests is tough and you're dealing with their reviews daily. I can remember being in the, the first few years that I owned the property, I was in and out of the office more often. And I can remember having a customer in there yelling and screaming in front of a bunch of people throwing this huge fit because she has a spider in her tent. You're like, lady, you're in the middle of the woods. Like there's not, what it's not like there's spiders everywhere. There's just going to be a spider. And luckily the cust another customer that was in the office said that like, lady, you're camping. <laughs> like there's still, you're still camping. Um, 
so it doesn't always meet people's expectations, you know? So making sure that your website spells that out really well, having videos and lots of photography so that you, the guests have a proper expectation of what they're going to get when they get there is very important because you want to make sure that they're not upset. Uh, we've had trees fall on them. Luckily, nothing, nobody's been hurt because lots of times they're in the woods. So keeping up, oh my gosh, the cost of having trees cut and removed has been one of the biggest sticker shocks for me um, in real estate. Like having tree removal is tens of thousands of it's dollars. It's expensive, yeah. Super expensive. So making sure that you budget each year to have somebody coming through and uh, getting rid of the branches and the limbs and different things and trees that could potentially be hazardous. Um, and you need proper insurance for whatever goes wrong with that. Um, I, uh, you want to use niche specific insurance too. I use a company called Levitt um, who, um, underwrites through, uh, Philadelphia insurance. So there's, there's specific insurance companies out there for that. So you want to be ready for whatever goes wrong with that, but there's horror stories in every asset, every asset class. And then the last question I had for you is what is the best advice for someone looking to start their glamping business and any final words as well too? Yeah, I would go stay in a couple. So pick a few that are drivable for you and easy to go to and go stay in a couple different ones and take notes on the things that you liked, the things that you didn't like. Um, maybe take a buddy with you that has slightly different expectations than you do or different travel experiences than you do so that you can get that same feedback from them so that you can look and see what's out there and what you'd like to do better and what you'd like to do the same as they're doing. You, that's nothing like kind of getting your hands dirty and going and figuring that out. That is so like simple, but great. Like basically going out there and experiencing like what is good and what is bad. Like it's funny because uh, I thought about at some point opening up a fund and now I've invested in some funds and now I'm like, okay, I like this about this fund. I like that about this fund. I don't like this. And it's almost like by experiencing that from a consumer's end, you get to get to know like what you can do to improve. Um, last question is you have, uh, I heard the word student sometimes, if somebody wanted to maybe learn from you, do you mind kind of telling them a little bit about your program and then also where can people can find you as well too? Yeah, I have a mastermind for RV park and glamping students that are learning all about the asset classes because a lot of times when you're learning about that stuff, it's about purchasing it, meaning leading up to how are you going to get it? And, um, these properties are heavy on operations, not just how do I get one? It's how do you operate it once you get it? Um, if you follow me on social media, you hear me talk about all these different streams of revenue that you have, and that's how it, that one property has over 10 streams of revenue. So, so pushing that and figuring out how to maximize that income is a big portion of operations. So uh, my, my students go through all kinds of information on how to push the revenue on those properties. And you can find all that information on my website at heatherblankenship.com or anywhere on social media at Heather Blankenship X3. So Heather, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for obviously taking the time to be on the show. I've enjoyed this. I didn't really know very much before I came into this interview, but I thought like, hey, look, I think it would be interesting. Uh, so I appreciate obviously you taking the time to do this. If anybody is interested in learning more from Heather, she shared with you where to find her. For all of our viewers, if you've enjoyed this interview, make sure to hit that share button. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you guys so much. This was episode number 132. And uh, thank you, Heather, from the bottom of our hearts. We appreciate you. Thanks for having me.